So one, one of the things that people, I guess, feel discouraged or in some way, I think this is you know, somewhat, um, I don't know what to say, I was going to say uh, irrational, but you know, that, that it's so complicated to switch. You know, I hear people say, well, I have, I have someone on oral meds and I've got the dose right and now you're telling me I, I should switch to a long acting and I don't know exactly how to do that. Is that a, is that a, a concern? Or? I, it's not a concern that I think is real. I mean, I remember all these tables about converting from 10 milligrams a day of flufenazine to whatever it was. And, and I, I found that complicated and, and I found it easier just to, you know, have a target dose that you think might work, you know, sort of an, an analogous target dose and just go for it. So I don't think it's that complicated. Mm, yeah, and I think you're, what you're doing is you're making an investment in a long-term treatment. So if it takes a little time, let's say, to titrate or to supplement with oral medication, if you have to for a couple of weeks, then you're, again, you're, you're making this effort for a, a reason that hopefully will be advantaging the patient over the long term. Some of the medications, it's clearly recommended that you have a cross titration. Mm -hmm. um, I, Consta was one, Risper, Risperidone Consta. Um, but but I, I, frankly, I think it's a good idea for all of them. Well, now <laughs> we have choices also. We have different formulations, some that require supplementation, some that don't, some have loading doses, some don't. So there are many more choices, but it's, you know, I think we just, people need to read the package insert, learn about a, a compound and learn how to use it. We talked a little bit before about um, the second generation drugs. And, you know, I remember years ago hearing after the introduction of the second generation drugs, people were saying, well, I'm not using an LAI because I don't have a second generation LAI. We just had haloperidol and flufenazine. Now we have a whole range of second generation LAI, so that's no longer a, a reason not to, to, not to use them. But we're still, you know, we're still struggling with this. We talked earlier about some of the potential advantages of the second generation drugs in terms of reducing um, neurologic side effects, but we, we still have concerns about some of the metabolic side effects. So one of the questions that comes up frequently is, you know, how do you decide which long-acting formulation to use? And, you know, my response to that is we, we have several now. Um, we, have, we have risperidone, we have paliperidone, we have olanzapine, we have aripurpazole. We have intramuscular, we have subcutaneous. We have um, injections that can be given every two weeks, every four weeks, every six weeks, every eight weeks, every three months. They're working on it every six months formulation. So there are lots of choices. And I think at the end of the day, it comes down to um, the clinical team deciding what's the best drug for a particular patient based on past history, past response, sensitivity to side effects, what have you. And then, you know, hopefully seeing that that drug's available in a long-acting formulation and working out a, a treatment plan. You know, we're going to use the oral meds first, we're going to establish the right dose, and then, then we're going to switch. And I think having choices is a tremendous advantage that, that uh, patients and clinicians and families now have lots of options. I mean, I think, I think in oral medications, you, you choose based on side effects, basically. These, there are a few other parameters here, the, the distance, the length of time between the shots. Um, I do feel obligated to put in my pitch here for our study that compared long-acting paliperidone to long-acting Haldol, you know, which, you know, they both worked very well. They had different side effect profiles. You know, predictably, Haldol had a little more on the neurologic side effects, and uh, the newer medication had more weight gain. But they both worked very well. And, and you know, that's another axis. I mean, Haldol is a lot cheaper. Um, you know, if you have insurance, you know, I, I'd pr probably go for a, one of the newer medicines, too. But it's a... Well, why? I mean, your study showed that the difference was side effects, so it's in some ways choose your poison. It, it is, it is, I mean, that was the, you know, the editorial that Don Goff wrote about our study said, this is, this is the evidence, even for these medicines, pick by side effect. I'm not disputing that. Well, but it'd be mm -hmm. nice is to have a comparative effect in the study for the newer medications. Between the newer medicines. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I still, I still worry about tardive dyskinesia, obviously. That's something that we spend a lot of time studying, and I think, uh, you know, the data, such as they are, I mean, the data are not great, because we don't do long, long-term randomized studies, but... You know, what we've seen in, in the analyses that we've done is that the rate of the incidence of tardive dyskinesia is about one-fifth with the newer drugs, what it was with the older drugs. You need a big study to show that. And you need, you need patients who are obviously who are vulnerable to developing tardive dyskinesia. So, you know, obviously there are trade-offs, but I, I guess I'm still in favor of the, of the second-generation drugs for that reason. Yeah. But we have the weight gain. I mean, 
Yeah, yeah no, there's a trade-off, and, and I will say for the the um, the Haldol paliperidone study that we did, Joe McAvoy was the lead author. You know, it was a fairly long study. It was 18 months, or actually even up to two years. It was up to two years, and we didn't get much of a signal on abnormal involuntary movements. We got a signal on akathisia. But, right. but yeah. I don't think I don't think the import of the study, or what uh, you're saying, Scott, is to advocate for first generation versus second generation because the main difference was economic. Right. And, and the thing is is that uh, you don't know what the comparative effectiveness is if you don't do this study. And so it would be good to know how aripiprazole, how uh, in Vega Sustena, or is it tri Trevina? Trevina? The Trinza. new one? Trinza? Trinza. Um, you know, how these, these compare. The other thing is that um, with TD, is there data on you know, particularly for first gen, is there data about TD incidents for people on long acting versus oral? Yes, there are. I mean, that was one of the questions that people had because initially there were some studies that suggested that maybe maybe the incidence was higher on LAIs, but the problem there is you have the confound of non-adherence. Yeah, right. And um, actually there are some studies suggesting that the intermittent use of antipsychotic drugs may be more deleterious in terms of the evolution of abnormal involuntary movements than continuous exposure. The nice thing about long-acting injectables is it not only ensures continuous exposure, but we can also be very confident that the patient is getting the dose that we intended. And then, you know, you mentioned earlier some of the studies that we did trying to find minimum effective dose. In all of those studies, we used long-acting injectable formulations because you don't want to go down to a micro dose with the possibility that the patient might miss a few uh, a, f a few doses and then you kind of don't know where you are.